maybe we'll answer the elephant in the room question. What the heck is a snask? Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm excited to chat with the founders of creative agency Snask, Freddie Ost and Eric Kolkum. Freddie was adopted from South Korea and raised in Northern Sweden after being found outside a police station. Eric is a confused and misunderstood misfit genius who believes that the feeling of freedom and allowance of making mistakes is key to creativity. Today, we're going to talk about how they formed Snask 14 years ago in the face of conventional wisdom and the meaning behind their mantra, make enemies and gain fans. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Snask. Okay, kids, all the way from Sweden, please welcome Freddie and Eric. Freddie and Eric, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. It's It's great to have you guys here. Yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> amazing. I love that little introduction. And it's not every day someone calls me a genius. Did we write that, Freddie? Or was <laughs> you know, mis- misfit also, Eric? So it was yeah, misfit yeah, it was more, and genius. It was more, mi- more misfit than genius, probably. That... <laughs> Well, maybe we can dig into that a little bit. I know we have a lot of ground to cover today, but you know, maybe we'll answer the elephant in the room question: What the heck is a snask? Where'd this, where'd this name oh, come from? <laughs> <laughs> so basically when we're at university, we sat and, and thought like, okay, what could we come up with? What name could we come up with for this amazing age that we're going to start? Um, so in, in England where we studied, uh, we talked a lot about eye candy. Uh, so snask in Swedish, old Swedish means candy, filth, and gossip. All in one word. <laughs> Don't ask us why. Our forefathers didn't have more words, uh, so they managed to put everything into this word. But it is it's a pretty also disgusting word in Swedish. It's not many people who likes to use it. Um, but we thought it was amazing to just use that for our agency. And we thought that yeah, we would start up this agency in New York or London, not in Sweden, where everyone knows what it means. But but yeah, then we moved home and everyone knows what it means. And Eric, you can maybe you can say what what people say about snasky or snask. Yeah, no, but exa- no, but exactly. I, I I I mean, the funny thing with the word is that it is Swedish and it has all this meaning. But we we kind of quickly noticed that uh, it worked very well, like outside of Sweden too. That like it gets almost like the same feeling. So it means like, like I said, like candy and like gossip, and it's kind of this like naughty word, or what you say, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe a way, weird way to explain. But like you know, and and so when, when people can say, "Oh, it's so snask," it's it's sort of you can almost say mm-hmm. that in Swedish too, a little bit uh, funny, like jokingly. But then when we went, yeah, when we went like abroad and started doing things in the U.S. or so, then like people like, oh, it's so snasky or, yeah, and it gets the same uh, vibe, I would say. So in that way, it it, it works really well. And, and yeah, it's fun. Yeah, what's, Josh, what, what do you think about the name when it says snask or snasky? <laughs> I think in context, you totally get <laughs> the feeling, ooh, that's so snasky. <laughs> Yeah, you don't even yeah, have right. to ne- necessarily know <laughs> yeah, what it means. Exactly, <laughs> but it's also a really pleasing sound, especially like in English words that have like that strong K sound, like our our words that we we get excited about. So like, it, yeah, that's it's just got got a cool ring to it, and also sounds like a made up word at the same time. So A plus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's in the Oompa Loompa forest. It's perfect. <laughs> we did have some of our like earliest clients though we like lost the client or two because of the name even because it was so mm. daring and different and crazy uh, you know back in conservative stockholm like 13 years ago or something but but i mean so it, it, that but that just made us even happier to use it of course mm. it, it's great that people reacted so much to use the stupid word <laughs> Well, it's polarizing, especially if it's, you know, it's interesting that it means candy and that it can have kind of this uh, negative connotation too. So that's, that's really interesting. 
Well, you guys yeah. talked about, um, you know, going to school in, in the UK. And um, so it sounds like there were some early, early uh, intertwinings of your paths. Um, but tell us about your origin stories. I'm, I'm curious. I don't know. If it makes more sense, Freddie or Eric, for you to start first, but I'll let you guys figure that out. Yeah, so I um, I was adopted from South Korea. Um, the stories I was found outside the police station, I later found out that that's one of five stories that everyone has who is adopted from South Korea, especially to Sweden. Uh, so that wasn't very unique. Um, I was brought up in the middle of, or northern Sweden, basically, with uh, in a loving family with four more siblings. Um, everyone around me when I grew up was like tall blonde people and then it was little me uh, thinking <laughs> I was Swedish and looked like them but I kind of didn't uh, then I, it kind of got strange I grew up realizing that I I wasn't playing on the same rules but I thought I was but because I looked different uh, things like yeah in puberty and everything things got harder and I think it made like I started hating, hitting on myself and not liking myself very much. And it's something I've been working on later, but yeah. And then I, I got into design and I think that that made my life so much more fun. I think that's the short version. Eric, what's your yeah. Yeah. rural, rural, <laughs> rural, 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 found outside the police station and was adopted <laughs> but we like both grew up in, in in sweden in a in a small town sort of and and like um come from where like you know like normal families swedish upbringing and 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 i think but we always had like a an interest for for um you know doing something more and not maybe like just fitting into the to the I would say like the 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 path that everyone takes or the that you should do and take you know so I I sort of also had that and then I um I went a lot like I wanted to I had I felt that pressure of doing something that could like be a job that you could do for a long time and become like a career sort of and I mm -hmm. hadn't really like understood that uh like how you could match sort of um, artistic ways with that like i play music and stuff but that was so hard to make it and my dad is an art teacher so it was like okay maybe that like you know you you can find it somehow but then for me and I, I started to study photography and and things like that and then i i thought that that was like okay a job and um, but then it sort of actually turned into more production and, and things like that within the industry and understood that like sort of an agency world could be could be something um so uh, i i'm actually not like an educated designer this can be important to know <laughs> i am i am only a misfit genius that's what i am <laughs> I have no, no no clue how, how to actually design something no but I, i'm you know and then then sort of through this these ways of like just trying to get into something where you could like use your ideas and your your like you know your energy and drive to create stuff, uh, but also have a job. That's sort of where we met. Like, and then it sort of you know uh, things. Another one thing led to another one. And I think there was more like a mindset and things like that. That was where like where we aligned a lot. You know, we became friends, basically. Yeah. So what was the vision initially? I know you guys said this is when you came up with your your idea. We'd call it SNAS because it's going to be in New York or, <laughs> or somewhere else where nobody knows what this means. But um, what was your vision for what the company would become? It was a lot was people told us when we started thinking about starting our own industry straight out of university they said you need at least 10 years of experience in the industry and when we thought whose experience is it that we're going to get and mm. most of the times it's old white man's experience and Kotler wrote his marketing theories before the internet even existed yet people still use them and we thought why not just 
start our own agency instantly, make all the mistakes ourselves, try and find our solutions to the problems, if it even is a problem, and then we should be able to find our own way, um, like the SNASC way of doing things further down the line. And let's say 15 years now later, we would have been five years now if we listened to those people. Now we're 15 years and let's say we, we think we still make mistakes. We still learn from them and try and carving out our way of doing things. Well, I, yeah, I right. think I said at the top of the show that it was 14 years. So that tells you how long it's been since we've been trying to get you guys on the show. <laughs> 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 so what was it about, uh, yeah. um, you know, so people were saying you need 10 years of experience. What, what did you guys learn early on or maybe what were some of the surprises um, or, or even the, the rough education or, or maybe it was really smooth. I don't know, but tell us about those, those early years. But I think, I think like, I mean, not like doing, like doing it our way meant of course, a lot of big challenge because we didn't know how to do anything more or less. Um, I mean, when do, so, so, I mean, that's what you, what you do then you try your, your ideas and, and you see how it works. And I think what we, what we quickly realized was that not everything works and uh, we need to learn from our mistakes you know so we quite early on like understood that like we need to try things but we also need to be humble enough to say that didn't work and then you know do it in a better way or find a better way but we wanted to try to keep on doing it uh, with from our, our own beliefs and not like again running over to someone that had experience and ask like how should we do it? this it wasn't the way you know so We've done so many mistakes and we've done so many great things as well, but that's just been a mix. But I can tell you from those first year, I can tell you everything, every decision that we did, everything, why we did it, how we were thinking about it, you know, what our emotion was like about these decisions, both creatively stuff, but also like on the business side with, uh, with staffing, et cetera, et cetera. It was like, Everything really has come from us trying to figure out how to do it. And, but then when you also do that for a while and you meet other people on the way, like you collaborate with clients and other agencies and so on. And in those first years, like in the meetings we had, like we're going to do some film production, let's say, and people use these buzzwords or... <laughs> actually or words that actually explain stuff but we just didn't know them yet and you're so scared you sit there and you're like i don't know this i have no clue what they're talking about you know you're saying yes to everything and then you try to figure it out but then after a while you notice that like everyone is playing that game no one really knows everyone just uses this way that you should talk about stuff and it's basically like we call it like playing grown-ups like everyone is <laughs> like behaving like kids more or less you know it's just on a different type of games that we play in that age than than earlier in in, in you know at the playground so i mean understanding that then you can sort of calm down a little bit and be like okay but it's fine to not know everything and let's you know instead try to create some honesty and like be be fragile and talk about what we don't know. Yeah, I and mean, we were always, I think, in a very bull non bullshit uh, attitude towards the industry and the clients and everything. And we never wanted to. I mean, we, of course, we did like everyone else, try some bullshit. Uh, it never worked. Um, and then we realized, why are we, why are we using these strange words that we don't even believe in, or why do we like pretend that a color means something? Uh, for example, in branding, when it clearly it doesn't matter, like a client, and but then we we'll notice the client starts bringing those that, those bullshit arguments up. Like red, red is a warning color by nature. Why did he use that for us? But red is like if that was true, that people would be afraid of the color red in branding uh, because it's like a warning color in nature. People wouldn't fly Virgin or Norwegian and they wouldn't drink from a red can of Coca-Cola, et cetera, et cetera. Everything has different meanings. Uh, well, one thing that can mean forgiveness in the West can mean death in China. So, I mean, 
in every little situation. If you're high on something, you might think of the color green. But if you uh, think about a cow eating grass, you don't think about getting high. I mean, it's so many different situations that, for example, most color theory within within our industry is is what we would call bullshit because it's very up to the subjective like every person's mind seeing a color interacting with it yeah that's that's really interesting you know we we hear so much of that as designers about you know you could google (laughs) right now what are the meanings of colors and you're going to get a whole lot of you know this conventional wisdom it's just so interesting how you guys have kind of buck that across the board um everything from how much experience you need to start an agency to to what colors mean and and all those kind of things what so i'm i have to imagine that your line of thinking attracts a certain kind of client or certain industries or maybe there are some industries you're more uh interested in um who are the clients that you guys pursue and um what kinds of work as snask uh been working on lately i mean uh the clients that we work with today we are currently rebranding bang and olufsen uh the legendary hi-fi brand uh we're working with uh, brands like klarna spotify uh lots of like different uh, kinds of brands but i mean also now we're 15 years old it's easy for us to sit and like oh we work with these big clients now but i mean for eight years it was hard we didn't work with like spotify or whatever so i mean yeah sorry Eric. yeah no no sorry i didn't at all want to shut you off oh, okay. but, <laughs> but I, I i i thought you were done continue no, uh, you have yeah no but uh but from the beginning it was pretty interesting because almost all our clients first five years were women um and men didn't seem to want to work with us because they thought we were uh, I don't know, uh, threatening to them because we had used the color pink, we used the name Snask, etc. But women didn't have any problems with that. Also, we worked a lot with friends and a lot of people say, you shouldn't mix friendship with business. But basically, that's what you should. You should be able to support your best friends going into business, especially the first three years. That's when you should, should support each other or you as a friend should pay the marketing price market price for your friend services it shouldn't be like i'm getting married could you do these these uh, postcards for me or invitations and i'm not gonna pay you what you're worth because you're my friend it should be the opposite because i'm your best friend i'm actually gonna pay you what you're worth Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's more how it should be i think it should be bring in friends ask people for help be vulnerable and i think that's one of the best way to grow when you're when you're starting up I think also what, what's actually really interesting with our journey in terms of like um, type of clients and type of work and so on is that from the beginning, we we had a like kind of like like a clear mindset on what we wanted to create. And, and so, you, you know, like our, let's say like visual language sort of, I mean, that comes from within. Uh, we wanted to do things more bold more expressive we wanted to do, be more daring in the design and in the expression and also want to be more tactile work a lot with our hands build things for real take it out of the computer the com- you know the computer is only a tool in the in the in the process of saying and that that was like something that we started out with we did that from the beginning and we have sort of kept on doing that since you know of course like it, it changes on the way some you learn new things and and whatever explore but the interesting in that i would say that we could look at the job that we did 10 15 years ago and it could look quite similar in one way in that direction today but yeah. the world around us that has changed all the time meaning trends so like we've been like we've been quite you know straight line doing our thing but then if we are out or in a trend is going like this during those five years you, you can like totally notice that both in like what what request we get but also how people speak about the work we do that like oh everyone does that or oh you're so unique no one else does what you guys do you know it's like i heard it all like through this 
this time. And, and that's, you know, that's also means that, for example, in the beginning, we worked a lot with culture and, and uh, that type of field because we, they were more open for new, you know, trying new, uh, exploring more uh, vision. But then today, that type of expression being a little bit more bold and, 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 and also like this tactile, like building things, studio sets and so on, has become like the biggest thing in like fintech world. <laughs> so, and all these like new tech companies. So we did a couple of those two, five years ago, and now all of them contact us because they want it as well. You know, So it's like, I don't know like who is to, it's not like we didn't ask for it, you know, but that sort of, it goes like that. It becomes that. After that. That's really yeah. interesting. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously the team is <laughs> at least the two of you. Tell us a little bit more about, um, the size and the shape of the team. I know we've had folks on the show who, you know, solo or duo entrepreneurs or teams of hundreds or teams of dozens. I'm just kind of curious how you guys have chosen to shape the agency and, and, and really what your plans are for size and scale. Yeah. I mean, we, we used to be up to 12 people and we thought when we started up, we thought, we thought for a long time that it was cool to have a lot of employees. Uh, and that was like a, a mission to like, oh, if we grow in numbers, that's a good thing because we're a company. And then we hit a, a milestone of 10 years and we started thinking like, why are we doing it this way? Should we be this many? Should we have this composition of people, et cetera, et cetera. And today, uh, at the moment, we're six people in the core team. We're female-led by our CEO, Gia. Uh, we are growing now uh, because we, have, we want to grow the core team, uh, but we don't want necessarily to just grow just because of growing. But we, we see that now we have a better setup of people and the way we can grow is more interesting. But we still have a huge set of freelancers around us uh, that we work regularly with. And a lot of them have been employed by us. A lot of them we've worked with for 10 or 12 years. So it's very like close friends for almost loads of the people that we still work with. So I don't want to I let this go. You I'm mentioned sorry. the female CEO. Is she one of your co-founders or did you bring her on later in SNASK? We brought we her on just in September. Yeah, oh, that's, that's interesting. So um, tell us about her role as CEO versus what the two of you are doing. Like how, how does that differ? Um, What's interesting is maybe what we were trying to do <laughs> before that, which was, which was everything. Uh, and that never really works that well. You know, I, I'm sure we, we haven't been, we, or I know we haven't been the best of bosses and with the best of leaders in many, many times through, through this, because we, maybe we've been trying to do too much and we've been mixing our jobs too, too, too much or, or, you know, and, so what we felt was that we needed to structure our company better and have had a, have a more solid and, and good leadership with someone that took, you know has that focus. Uh, while me and Freddie, I would say, are maybe more trying to be on the output end a lot more, not like focusing on the vision. So projects that we do and also of course internally of you know um yeah like we talked about visual style and attitude and all of that you know and and, and try to do that better um of course together with the whole team but like uh, yeah that's sort of the plan so this whole like sort of organizational change that's happening now with also um hopefully growing a little bit that's something that she's in charge of so to say so i mean the, yeah that's the plan <laughs> i don't know if freddie wants to add something it's kind of new so. <laughs> no? no i mean that's that's fine yeah it sounds good <laughs> it's exactly how it is we're super happy for that she's here and she's leading us into the future 
uh, and that's something we haven't had before. So I think that's super nice. I mean, so it's, I, you, it's very important to know. I just wanted to say something like about this whole like we are really that type of company that friends found, you know, together with no clue what a business is. Like no clue. That has never been the idea of SAS. It's been about something else, about having fun, doing cool work, being able to do the type of work that you want to do and so on. But with not thinking about how will my work hours look but you know it's more about the actual what i mean the work that we do the creation itself maybe and and then it's fun to like create an organization where you have staff and take care of people and like that's interesting and, and fun and we love to make people happy like that but we never had a business <laughs> like we never really like we never put up really business goals for ourselves and you know, and therefore we never really had like a, a clear leadership. We always been like dividing it between us. And now it's me and Freddie that are, are partners in the company. So to say, but before we had, we also had Mags, we, we were more people and it was always like divided. So I, 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 that's like, um, yeah, it's just important to know where we come from there. I think it's, it's, this is like, for us, it's a huge thing now what's happening too, but and it's all for the better, but like, it almost sounds stupid, but we never really like, that's never like been really our plan before. It's never been like our focus, you know, it's like we're growing up now. We were like a football team without a coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we, we love playing football, so <laughs> let's just do it and it, it would probably be fine. Yeah soccer that is so so maybe this is a good segue you know i was going to say something about quarterbacks and then i realized you were talking about a different football so i'm glad i didn't <laughs> wander down that path um maybe this is a good segue to talk about your mantra which uh i read at the top of the show make enemies and gain fans i mean a little bit of that may be self-explanatory but tell us where that came from and kind of what the how you guys take that to mean it's uh, it's basically our belief in uh, in branding, uh, and it stems from we strongly believe that both individuals, but also brands and companies, need to have opinions, uh, and you need to also stand up and voice your opinions. I think we owe the next generation this, and and the generations before us as well. Um, and when you do that, when you stand up for your beliefs, um, you will get enemies for sure. But you will get the right kind of enemies, the enemies you don't want as friends or fans anyway. Um, and you will also get fans, people who actually like you and, and, and that shares your values. And also, if you're a brand, you will get people who don't just scroll past your post. They will stop. They will like. They will share. They will tag their friends. They will comment. They will favorite your post, et cetera, et cetera. It's called engagement. Um, and it's basically, that's where it stems from. And then we also have a book that's called Make Enemies Again Fans, uh, which is about our first five years in the business and also explaining how we think about this. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where it is. Eric, do you have anything to add there? Not no? really. It sounds great. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, as we're recording this, uh, it's early February 2022. Um, COVID is still a thing if you're listening in the future and <laughs> hopefully this is a distant past memory. Uh, but how has uh, dealing with COVID in Sweden been for your business and how has it changed how you operate or made things better or worse? Wow, well, uh, that's a good question that we maybe don't have the full answer on all of it yet but 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 it's it has changed a lot of course because when i mean it's been two years now and i i remember i was on a shoot like in ukraine or so you know when it was starting to happen we were like flying home and then i was in another shoot at home and we were in this like big studio and we couldn't you know you're there all day and then the whole world was falling apart on our phones. Like we were getting notifications mm. about 
everything was shutting down and you know we had the norwegian photographer with us there and he couldn't like how we would he ever you know the door the let's say the, the borders are closed down like how, how do you even get home it was changed a lot of our you know of course you're you get out of your bubble a little bit like you, the world something else is going on and, or shoot you know and 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 I think after that, we panicked a little bit, like everyone did, like what's happening. But quite quickly, we noticed that we were still getting requests of work. And it was like we could adapt a lot to working from home and, and distance, which we weren't really doing that much before. We were like doing it just when it had to be done, if someone was traveling or you know, something like that. But otherwise we were at the office more or less, you know, five days a week. And now we are never there. If you like. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's like, that. that's also not true. Like we are there, but we, we, we are, we will never go up back to like, you have to be at the office five days a week. Mm. Like we, now we have some, I think it's like some three, two rule or something. We try to like, you know, that we, we want to meet and, we try to, but that's where flexible and then still like right now, COVID is going on so fully. So the recommendation is still here to work, work from home. Um, this fall, we, we had like, we were going back a little bit to normal, but then, yeah, it came back. So, but I think like, it, it, you know, so it's definitely changing. I, it, like I said, it's hard to say because it will be different, you know, but I, you you almost like first you notice like oh it's fine to work from home like oh it's kind of nice oh this i feel more free like with my with everything else going on and so on. but like now it's almost like oh it's kind of nice to work at the office and have colleagues and go somewhere <laughs> and talk to people you right. know so it's like yeah I have yeah i think it's, uh, it's, it's a really more. interesting thing that happened for us and the rest of the world showing that people can be trusted as them please uh, as long as they do what they're yeah. supposed to do they can work from anywhere basically and if we can have meetings and workshops we thought would be impossible and then we discovered a lot of software and you can do it online and I was hey this is almost even more efficient than than actually being in a room moving around sometimes and so that's that's it's rad that's super interesting to to go, it's like an and experiment that, I, that if someone has closed down the whole world for two years and see, like, let's see what happens. And yeah, <laughs> but I mean, and and at the same time, it, it is strange to have clients that you work with now for maybe a year or a long time that you never met in real life, mm -hmm. and and you talk to them like this online, and you you get you know you you create images of who they are and. You know, you have a relationship, but it's only like like that. And and I, I mean, that's fine. That's how it is. But it, it's it's definitely different. I, I'm looking forward to meeting them one day because I mean, it's a part of what we do. A fun part, I think. With what we do is that we work with people, and it's like socializing and you know, getting to know people from different cultures with different backgrounds and different. You know, um, uh, let's say. Um, yeah, they all have different. Uh, um, I love when I can't when I lose a word, but like uh, things they need to solve. <laughs> 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 so yeah, so um, but like you know, so so it, it's it's it, that's a, a fun part of the work we do. Uh, so you know, you don't want to lose that forever, as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of how you're working, uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned doing this show for the last, I don't know, I think it's been six years at this point, um, is that there's no such thing as a typical day for uh, folks who run design firms. But I'm, I'm curious what types of things each of you work on in a given day, like what what might a day look like for each of you? Or maybe what are some of your your favorite things that you get to work on during the week? I mean, I think, yeah, I used to be a designer. <laughs> then, I, then we basically realized that there are better designers than us. So let's just hire them instead. <laughs> um, then, uh, yeah, and then my my works 
slowly during these 15 years became uh, answering emails. Uh, so if I would be cool, I would say I do brand strategies, I do like client work and do lots of, try, like, lots of these cool things. But my girlfriend sees me every day and she's like, no, you're answering emails. That's, that's your fucking work. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I would say that my everyday life now during pandemic is I'm sitting in the kitchen with my laptop and I'm kind of getting bored with it staring at the screen all the time. Um, but otherwise, otherwise, I think it's much more like being in meetings, discussing strategies, of course. Uh, yeah. How about you, Eric? Yeah. <laughs> You want to know? But um, yeah, I, I, no, but it's, it's of course very similar. I think that the, the difference maybe is that I, um, I try to mix that with like, I need to like sort of write down. I work when I do more of the maybe film work that we do. So it's like I'm, I sit and write ideas or scripts or find references and create treatments and stuff that, that I do. If I just think about what I've done today or yesterday, and that's like half of the day is more like trying to to do that. And which is kind of boring to do at, at home or like that's one of those where you feel like you want to get inspired a bit. But but I must say, like Freddie is saying, like it's sometimes it's like, oh, it, it, it's this old. We sit and email all day, <laughs> you know, and it's a little bit like it's not that fun sometimes. But I, for example, when we do get to shoot and like, you know do productions and then we can be on a set for a week or something i mean that's for me that's like super important to have that as well to to mix it up a little bit and like a week of that or a shoot or something that can last for months you know because it's then you get to be more hands-on and and, and uh, yeah really feel what you do a little bit more than these emails that get lost <laughs> Well, I'm guessing maybe email isn't the answer to this one, but shifting gears a little bit, what would you say is one of your proudest professional moments? I think for me personally, I think it's when we did Mount, the last year of Malmo Festival, which is one of Scandinavia's biggest city festivals. And uh, we had worked with them. We were on our fifth year with them. We had a lot of trust and we just decided to like, why not make your identity like 13 meters tall, long and nine meters wide and go up and shoot it from the air and then create a whole festival area of your identity that we can pre-produce before, photograph it 30, 40 meters up in the air and then place it as its own area on the actual city festival. And yeah, said and done, we did that. And for me, I think that hit a mark that I will never be able to do again in that level because the joy as a designer and creative to see something built up that big that becomes something it's it's just very hard to beat I think maybe going to Boris Johnson's parties in pandemic would be the maybe <laughs> yeah and this is the past so maybe he's not the prime minister anymore when he listens to this who knows let's hope that <laughs> Yeah. No. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's hard to answer because it's like, I'm sure there's, if I would actually think about the work we do and then it would be a different answer, like right in this moment. But when I think about more, if I look back on things, I think it's different, you know, because we, the work is sort of, we used to do is a project after project, after project, after project sometimes. And sometimes we don't stop, stop up enough to like appreciate what we create and so i'm happy like i love the project that freddie mentioned it's like one of my favorites too and like how we solve them thing and was such a challenge in so many ways but i i can mention though like on a i i find like i said i find the question hard but like one thing was when we got mentioned in the were 50 top 50 companies where creative would kill to work you know um which was so like um came from nowhere we had no clue like we weren't trying to be on that list so to say or 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 so and and we are a small like swedish company we were you know like 10 employees in sweden and uh, barely here no one knows about us it feels like sometimes you know and and but we know that we like 
got in our work and our name and some brand out there in the the world of like in the creative community but then to end up on that list and and what you see us with who we were there with and that was kind of fun that like it was all these enormous companies and NASA and the only other Swedish company was Spotify on that list you know so Mm -hmm. somehow that, that you know it's on a different it's more like on a overarching thing but it was like kind of fun that we built that and people like appreciates it and think you know seem to think that we have fun and want to hang out (laughs) (laughs) that's good do you guys do either of you have uh design heroes either folks that you looked up to while you were coming up in the biz or even design heroes that you look up to now i think for me, I was I was reading uh, Carlson Wilker Jarling Yalti's uh, book. Tell me why, and it's an amazing book about their first first year in the business. I think, and to me, they were they were a lot of design heroes when I was a student, and I also later did a very short internship with them. Uh, and they are amazing people, and they were a big design hero for me. But then, in the today, I think I like. That Jessica Walsh is lifting uh, subjects that she doesn't really have to do, but she does it anyway. Like she is political, anti-Trump. She she talks about mental disease and and mental health issues and and I don't know, showing herself vulnerable. And she's in a position where she wouldn't have to. She could just go on be a superstar designer and everyone still love her. But then she does this thing, which I think is important, and I admire her for that. Nice. Eric, anybody yeah. that you'd add to that list? Yeah, I mean, exactly. The the ones Freddie mentioned are amazing. So, uh, But I would also, for me, uh, mention Eric Kessels. Um, Kessels Kramer uh, agency. And I mean, he, why it's more like, uh, for me, maybe also not coming really in as a, like a designer in that aspect. You know, I'm, I, 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 um, he mixed like the design world with um, a lot of humor, low amount of humor, but also like sort of a kind of like looking at the world perspective of like taking a step back and giving it some meaning. Uh, that maybe is not always beautiful. It can be like we're ugly, actually, and you know. But it it, it he, he he curates the the world a little bit uh, and 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 shows it to us. And and it's like, um, yeah, I uh, that gave that inspired me a lot that you could do that. That not everything was just this like perfect design surface all the time. It was like something else that I. Like yeah, that inspired me a lot. I Did it also kiss have, him on the mouth? Yeah, on the yacht? yeah exactly. I, was, I have a, a funny story about that because <laughs> I, we were in South Africa and uh, at the in the Sign in Daba festival, and and he was there as well, giving also a lecture. So we were. It was some like lecture, like. Um, meet up in the first day and then i was like oh my god eric (laughs) castles is here i have to talk to him you know and then and we were on this jaw like i was very like weird and so i woke up to him and i just look at him and he looks at me and and of course like you don't know what to say or whatever and i was just like i love you and that was the first thing I said, I love you. And then we shake hands and then he looks at my hand and then he's like, but if you love me, we should kiss. And I was like, okay. And then we start kissing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, yeah, that was my first impression. Uh, that was our first 10 <laughs> seconds together. <laughs> so it was good. And then, then it became like, then we kissed every time we met since then. So now it's almost like a, <laughs> difficult pressure like we, had, we shouldn't do this anymore <laughs> he's a very nice guy <laughs> that's awesome they say you should uh, never meet your heroes I don't know about what they say about kissing your heroes <laughs> yeah man I don't know don't know so the theme of this show uh, maybe not a surprise obsession um, 
I'm curious, you know, creative types, we just get obsessed with things. And sometimes it's a lifelong obsession and sometimes it's a brief moment and it's not always design or creativity related. But I'm curious for each of you, what you find that you're most obsessed with right now. I feel, I feel personally I'm most obsessed last couple of years in personal development and trying to find my my role as a like male in the 21st century because I think I grew up in with a very toxic masculinity macho uh, belief that I have to be very like uh, macho or whatever uh, and trying to break that down and build it up again to be more vulnerable to be more be able to speak about how I feel and things I need etc because I think I've been totally like flushing that away less pushing that down never thinking or feeling about what i feel or need or i can ask for things so for me that's i think that comes to mind that's my my big obsession at the moment eric yeah. what about you yeah i find this so hard to answer uh which it shouldn't be though but i i think i've been um Right, right now, I'm just been obsessed with film photography. I don't know. It, it's like a, a maybe that's a very sort of wide common thing. But I, I've been I I had like um, I had like a concussion for like a, a couple of months ago or something, and I it's been like in my. Um, uh it's been like you know i've been having a bit of headaches and so on but it's it's getting a lot better but i've been there for i've been a bit on a sick leave and i've been home forever now and then on top of that i had corona so, you know it was just like mm. i've been in my in, in the living room for like two months and then you start like nerding into things so i've, I've been like uh diving into but not like not like a particular one or anything more like just like trying to grasp more about the, the the skills behind and what you can do and for our next project coming up i'm thinking we should shoot on film <laughs> and not you know it's like now we have to do that um <laughs> but yeah that's been my latest like you know when i noticed that a few hours has passed and it's been like looking at images for <laughs> or like tech specs so, what's yeah. your obsession josh oh man they are there are so many of them uh this is one particular really nerdy one is uh i was working on a small video project and i was just fed up with all the programs and i started teaching myself da vinci resolve uh <laughs> which is like getting into the super geeky territory but it's just it's just been a pleasure and it's like you know, you can Google anything or YouTube anything and find all the answers to how to do all these things. But the one particular thing that I just solved was I was trying to figure out how to make these locked off tripod shots look like they were handheld. And I feel super nerdy to say that I figured out how to do that in DaVinci Resolve. Mm. So <laughs> Nice. Nice. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> and then tomorrow it'll be something else. But that was that was today. <laughs> <laughs> um well hey as we're starting to wind down here i'm curious if you guys uh either of you or both of you have a favorite piece of advice that you pass along to folks that you work with or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've received previously in your career I me mean, i think uh that change change is happening and i think that everyone privately need to understand that change is not optionable uh because we are getting older we're getting more obsolete even if we're trying to change even if we try to keep up so i think just realizing that okay constantly changing is what we need to do and i think that's my best advice because i think me myself was very stuck that i thought i was a genius until i realized i was a misfit genius um <laughs> and i think that knowing that early on this is it's a good good set of knowledge yeah i like that totally. Eric? um no but i i 
I would go into the whole thing of give yourself freedom to make mistakes. Like mistakes are actually totally fine and can be good. You know, it's um, maybe in a creative process, it's about giving yourself time to be able to make mistakes and still, you know, catch up or, um, you know, you can't figure everything out immediately, especially if you want to, you know, push the envelope and do something new or, you know, try, try things out, you know, so don't be, don't be too hard on yourself that it needs to be perfect from the start. Like do mistakes, get up and come back, you know? Yeah. That's good stuff. That works. Well, hey, before I let you guys go, um, tell us where our listeners can learn more about Snask or follow the two of you online or even track down your book. Well, I think uh, easiest way is uh, snask.com, of course, uh, and our Instagram. That's where, because we're not uh, listening to our own, own advice, so we're not on TikTok. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, personally, uh, yeah, I think that's that's where you guys can find us. Uh, Eric, do you have any other links for them? No, oh, I, I didn't really follow what you said, even some link where, where are we instagram we're on instagram <laughs> yeah instagram is fine. we have a website That's... we have a website www.snask.com <laughs> <laughs> um i can leave my number so <laughs> yeah don't become obsolete guys yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah but we're there. You can have fun and communicate with us. I'm sure. <laughs> Love it. Well, you guys have been awesome to have on the show. Thanks so much for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you for having hey, us. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 170 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.